Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Ve salatu ve selam ala seyyidil mürselin. Seyyidina ve habibina Muhammed ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve sellem teslimen kathira. Rabbana laka elhamdu kema yanbagi. Rijalari vecek ula azimi sultanik subhanaka ala muhsi thanaen alik ente kema thneyte ala nefsik. اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا وكرة أعيننا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أهلا وسهلا ومرحبا الله بارك فيكم ويتقبل منكم وزادكم الله في كل خير ونسأل الله لكم ولنا وللمسلمين جميعا التوفيق والعافية. So we we'll continue with the uh, farewell message of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. His last advice to humanity uh, before his passing صلى الله عليه وسلم. <coughs> so the thing we point we left off with last week was the sanctity of life. Uh, we mentioned صلى الله عليه وسلم. أن دماءكم وأعراضكم حرام عليكم حتى تلقى حتى تلقوا ربكم كحرمة يومكم هذا في بلادكم هذا في شهركم هذا. So your your lives and your honor are sacred to each other until you meet your Lord. Like the sanctity of this day of yours in this land of your this month of yours in this land of yours. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So then he says, so from there he moves from the sanctity of life to the conveying the trust that are owed to each other, to the earth, to Allah Ta'ala, to the Messenger of Allah, to the angels. So he says, فَمَنْ كَانَتْ عِنْدُهَا مَانَةٌ فَلْيُؤَدِّهَا إِلَىٰ مَنْ اتَّمَنَهُ عَلَيْهَا So he said, whoever has been amongst you, uh, or whoever has been entrusted with something, let him convey that trust to whomsoever has entrusted him with it. So delivering the trust, this is uh, an integral part of our religion. And the trusts are vast, as you mentioned. Uh, we've been entrusted with this life, we've been entrusted with this body, some of us have been entrusted with children, some of us have been entrusted with proper property, with wealth, some of us have been entrusted with public offices and duties. All of those, wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah, have to be delivered to their rightful possessors. Allah Ta'ala mentions in the Quran, in Allah ya'mburukum an tu'addu la manati la ahliha, وَإِذَا حَكَمْتُمْ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ أَنْ تَحْكُمُوا بِالْعَدْلِ إِنَّ اللَّهِ نِعِمَّا يَعِدُكُمْ بِي إِنَّ اللَّهِ كَانَ سْمِعًا بَصِيرًا So Allah has commanded you and Allah يَأْمُرُكُمْ أَنْ تُؤَدُّوا الْأَمَنَاتِ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهَا That you deliver the trust to its rightful possessors. That you deliver the trust. So this is a commandment from Allah. وَإِذَا حَكَمْتُمْ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ أَنْ تَحْكُمُوا بِالْعَدْلِ so if you rule or judge, or we should say judge or rule, between people that you do so with justice. So if we judge between people, we have to be just. We can't say, uh, okay, how much justice can you afford? How much justice can you afford? Oh, you could afford a lot, you get a lot. You can't afford much, you won't get much. They say nowadays, this doesn't apply to Ian when he gets done and Sumaya, inshallah. Mm -hmm. But the average lawyer out there, when you go to see them, the first question is, how much justice can you afford? Mm -hmm. The average doctor doesn't ask you where it hurts, he asks, how are you gonna pay? If you don't have insurance, they say, well, I don't know if I can help you. Because the Hippocratic Oath has become the hypocritic oath. Anyway, we, should not be involved with any of that. Why is this sacred? It's a commandment from Allah. Inna Allah ya'murukum. Allah commands you. And to addu la manati la ahliha. That you deliver the trust to its rightful possessor. 
So even if someone loans you money, so if someone gives you a dollar to hold, hold this dollar for me. You can't spend it and then give them another dollar. You have to give them the exact dollar they gave you. Because what if, what if they said, uh, or let's say a hundred dollars, a little weightier. Or if they said, you, he gave you a, a serial E hundred dollar bill and you gave him back a B. And then they said, after you gave it back, all the B series are null and void. Then you violated the trust. Or what if, the, what if the dollar he gave you was a, a good one, or the hundred dollar bill, and the one you gave him back unwittingly was counterfeit. So he goes to the store, and the merchant says, wait a minute, this is a counterfeit one. Then you violated the trust. In the old days, he gives you a gold coin that's 100% pure. You give him back a gold coin, 90% pure. They both look the same. So if you're entrusted with money, with cash, you have to give back the exact bills, the exact coins that you were given. Otherwise, you violated the trust. This is how precise the divine law is in that regard. And it's general, as we said, in, in, in anything. So if you rule or judge between, judge or rule between people, and taqamu bil atl that you do so with justice. You do so with justice. Blind, impartial justice and fairness. Inna Allah ni'ma yadukum bi. What an excellent thing Allah commands you with. Inna Allah kana sami'an basira. Allah hears and knows all. <coughs> Ibn Taymiyyah mentions in his book, as Siyasat uh, Shari'ah, we could say, uh, divinely legislated politics, uh, that this verse is the foundation of the relationship between the ruler and the ruled. That the ruler has been entrusted with a public office and has a responsibility to deliver that trust to the people. So it's not, rule should not be self serving, it should not be self aggrandizing. It should not be uh, partial towards one family, clan, ethnic group, neighborhood. It should be taken as a trust, a weighty trust, given by Allah Ta'ala to those he tests with it, to be executed with perfect impartiality and with the interest of the rule, ruled at heart. And the Prophet Sallallahu demonstrated that he didn't usurp anyone's money. He could have could have taken everything everyone had if he were, were not just. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he died, he didn't have any money. He didn't leave, he couldn't leave anything to his immediate family. So Bani Hashim, Bani Abdul Muttalib can't receive zakat. This is his opinion, Shafi opinion. They can't be enriched by the public wealth and public lands. And this is a controversy between the Sunnis and Shi'i. They say the, the, that uh, Abu Bakr and Umar took the land that was left for Fatima, but it was public land that the family of the Prophet ﷺ couldn't inherit. And that was from the perfect justice of the Prophet ﷺ that was the greatest door to, to, to nepotism. It's, leaving things and giving favors to your family and your kids and kin. So that door was closed so that the rule could be impartial and they'll get their reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the uh, great uh, trusts is privacy, which we don't have any of today. And, and we don't have it because people have gotten away from religion. religion. Religion provides the objective is from, from God. A Christian might say it's from on high. It's not from, from any of us. Standard for us to have an ethical foundation to check what we can do. 
So all this technology is enabling us to do uh, some wonderful things, but it's enabling us to do some really terrible things. Like the NSA, why are they spying on the leaders of friendly nations? Because they have the techno cap technical capability to do it. You know, why, why are these companies making genetically modified plants? Now all the bees are dying because the bees have been coded to respond to these flowers over thousands of years, if not millions of years. The, the genetic code, now they alter the genetic code, the bee doesn't recognize the flower. So they don't feed on it, and they're, so they're dying. So we're so smart, right? We can make high yield plants, we can feed the planet, not without the bees. Oh, we didn't think about that. There's a lot we don't think about. Why do we make bombs that can kill everybody? Because we can do it. So we have to have an ethical standard that checks. And this is what Allah has established for us. It's called is, is the limit set by God. Tilka hududullah These are the limits set by God. Don't transgress them. Tilka hududullah These are the limits set by God. Don't even come close to them. So it's not about what we can do, it should be about what we should do. You know, we can create an economic system where only the top 1% have any meaningful or viable economic activity. So everyone else just sits around idly and because idle people tend to get restless, we'll build prisons and put them into prisons. Or because we can, create a virus will kill off. I'm not saying AIDS came like this. I'm just speaking hypothetically. Because we can make a virus to kill off billions of people who are useless now, as far as we are concerned, whoever we are. Because we can do it, we will do it. Because there are no ethical stand of uh, boundaries to check our actions. And this is the, this is the job of the Muslims. <coughs> I can't speak for other religions. I'm not a member. <laughs> I'm not a member. I'm not a car-carrying Christian. I used to be. I just speak for the Muslims. This is our job, is to let humanity know about these limits. We can't just sit back in the masjid and, and just talk to each other. We have to go out there and share this. We have to inform people. We have to let people know. We have to be filled with a sense of mission and purpose. Otherwise, we're like the proverbial feather in the wind. Just whichever way the wind blows, there we go. So privacy is one of those great trusts. And now we don't have privacy. You, you give a talk like this. We're talking to people in the masjid here. Probably most are Muslim. If not, everyone has some understanding of Islam. We can say things, you'll understand them. If we're, saying, if we're speaking in a, in a theoretical, hypothetical sense, as a Muslim, you immediately understand. But you, you, you take it and then blast it out into cyberspace, and then there are people out there, they have no context. So you're saying, listen, this is a private talk. But someone, because you know they want to drive traffic to their little Facebook page, they put it out there, and the next thing you know, there are big problems for people. Work is being undermined. Leaders are being villainized, etc. So privacy is 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 huge. Our Prophet وسلم, in addition to the trust that it involves, he said he emphasized that, or what we just mentioned in the Quran, in Allah, so what we say with each other is an amana that we owe to each other. He called sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-majalisu bil amana. That private settings are involve a sacred trust. You have to ask, I know someone that gave a khutbah recently. They didn't want it broadcast to the whole world, but it's out there. No one asked them. 
You know, and that's a, that's a trust you owe to that person. Can I put this on YouTube? No one even asks you anymore. Just, oh, I got it. I recorded it. It's in my phone. I can do whatever I want with it. It's, 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 uh, and then so what happens? You'll find people uh, not, not giving serious talks. Because you guys need to hear this, but if, if I'm not sure you're the only ones that are going to hear it, I'm going to hold back. Because, and people might say, you know, well, you should just tell it like it is, brother. Believe me, they're not going to pay your bail. <laughs> I'm serious. You just, you'll be left, you caught out, I'm telling you. They're not going to pay your rent. Allahumma salli ala rasulillah al majalis bil amana private meetings involve a sacred trust now this look everything you say is being recorded your phone is recording you even when it's off they know where you are at all times now they're talking about uh, driverless cars, they, they know where you go, all that information will be going to some supercomputer, where you go, how you move, you know, so, and then so the driverless car will suddenly malfunction at the most inopportune time. So, oops, whatever, but all that information, your, your shopping patterns, the driving pattern. Now they said people get around the system economically. Well, you use a credit card, they know where you bought gas, where you bought food, where you bought toothpaste, where you bought pampers for your baby. You shouldn't be buying pampers. You should buy reusable cloth diapers, but that's a whole other issue. They know everything. They, where you did now, so you use cash to get around. And now they're going to put chips in the cash. So when you take the cash out of the ATM, they know you took this particular dollar bill. It's got a chip in it. And when you go to the store, they'll scan it. So you won't even be able to escape with cash. You have to move to a mountain. Well, there's no privacy. We have a constitutional amendment guaranteeing privacy. But if people just sit back and let everything be taken, then... Who, who are we to blame? But the point is, Islam, Islam emphasizes the Qur'an, the Sunnah of our Prophet ﷺ. The laws derived therefrom emphasize privacy and the right to privacy. This is something that, that we should uphold and we should be very uh, careful because we forget. We, we forget and then we take liberties that are not sanctioned by Sharia. They're not sanctioned by Sharia. And we get into trouble because we have to answer to Allah. We don't answer to the person whose rights we violate, but we're going to definitely have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu al mustaan. So then, after mentioning the uh, sanctity of life and then the sacred nature of trust, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He mentions usury and interest-bearing transactions. فَقَالَ وَإِنَّ الرِّبَ الْجَاهِلِيَةِ مَوْضُوعٌ وَلَكِنْ لَكُمْ رُؤُوسُ أَمْوَارِكُمْ لَا تَظْلِمُونَ وَلَا تَظْلَمُونَ وَقَضَى اللَّهُ أَنَّهُ لَا رِبَى وَإِنَّ أَوَّلَ رِبَى أَبْدُوا بِهِ عَمِّعَ الْعَبَّاسِ إِبْنُ عَبْدُ الْمُطَّلِبِ So he says, صلى الله عليه وسلم, the interest from users' transactions contracted before Islam is waived. However, you can, so even if you contracted this interest before Islam, it's null and void. No one can give or take any interest. However, you can keep the principle involved, but the principle, that is, you have a right to that. You will not oppress others, nor will you be oppressed. Allah has decreed that there is no, to be no interest and the first interest to be waived is owed to my uncle Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. So again, the Prophet ﷺ starts with his family. 
So this isn't uh, something for all of you folks out there, but those close to me, you know, we have this little thing going on. No, he said, the first interest to be waived is that of my uncle Abbas. So in other words, I'm starting with the members of my own family. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So there's a connection between interest and oppression that's been recognized by all of the Abrahamic religions. Taking people, uh, making wealth uh, without providing any immediate service, without doing any work, was considered to be sinful and is considered to be against the natural order, the fitrah that God created people upon, that Allah Ta'ala created uh, people upon. The, the, the natural disposition. We were created to earn for ourselves and we were created from our own labor and we were created to serve others through our own labor and efforts. Kuntum khayru ummatun ukhrijat linnas. You're the best people raised up to serve humanity. Linnas ayli khidmatin nas. Kama qala al-mufassirun. That you were the best of nations raised up for humanity. That is to say to serve humanity. To advance the common good of humanity. And interest doesn't do that. So just I want to give you a an idea first by just quoting some of the biblical prohibitions against interest and there, there are many. So interest, this system we have, a global finance, you have to remember this is a 20, well in, in its current form it's a 20th century innovation and, and being widespread in human societies globally is never, it's unprecedented globally being widespread is only a couple hundred years old. It's not something that uh, has been with us. And one of the things that shaitan does when shaitan introduces these things, then it's a, it becomes what's known as a fait accompli. It's, a, it's an established fact, you can't go back. Just, this is how it has to be. Why does it have to be like this? For, for most of human history, it wasn't like this. Human beings so fundamentally different today. Like you slap them real hard, they won't say ouch. No, they still say ouch. You pinch them, they still say ouch. Unless they wired a little funny, they might laugh. <laughs> Do it again. <laughs> but normal human beings, you pinch them, they say ouch. They're, they're thirsty, they drink water. If someone's in the desert and they're dying of thirst, then you give them a cold soda. There's, they want water, they don't want a cold soda. It'll make them more thirsty. Uh, they, they're hungry, we eat. We're tired, we sleep. That's the nature of human. We look for something to worship. They don't, if they take away Allah Ta'ala, they all start worshiping the devil or themselves, or their clothing, or their cars, or who knows what. But anyway, just to give an idea of the ancient uh, moral outrage that interest involved, just read some verses from the Bible. First one, the first one is from Exodus 22:25. If you lend money to any of my people who are poor among you, you shall not be like the money lender to him. You shall not charge him interest. Then Leviticus 25, 36, and 37. Take no interest, no usury or interest from him, but fear your God that your brother may live with you. That's which is really deep. Uh, and then in 37. You shall not lend him your money for usury, nor lend him your food at profit. And so Islam provides interest on money and food. So things have to be like a dhahab lil dhahab wal fidda lil fidda wal mil lil mil wal qum lil qum. Like gold for gold, silver for silver, salt for salt, wheat for wheat. 
it's, it's, it's money and it's food. And so here in the Bible, both are mentioned. Nor lend him your food at a prophet. Fear your, fear your God. So again, it's not, it's not what you can do, but I can do this. He doesn't have money. He needs it so badly, I can charge him for it. It's not what you can do, it's what you should do. And what you should do, what we should do, is, is to a large extent predicated on the depth of our fear for Allah. Uh, Deuteronomy 2320, you shall not charge interest to your brother. Interest on money or food or anything that is lent out at interest or increase. Jeremiah 15.10 Woe is me, my mother, that you have borne me a man of strife and a man of contention to the whole earth. I have neither lent for interest nor have men lent to me for interest. Every one of them curses me. So he's lamenting that he hasn't done these grave crimes. Known people for interest, nor taken interest from others, yet still the people, they curse him. Uh, if he has not oppressed anyone, but has restored to the debtor his pledge, has robbed no one by violence, but has given his bread to the hungry and covered the naked with clothing, if he has not exacted usury, nor taken any increase, but has withdrawn his hand from iniquity, and executed true judgment between man and man, if he has walked in my statutes and kept my judgments faithfully, he is just, he shall surely live, says the Lord God. Ezekiel 7, 9. That's the good man, the good person. Uh, who's the bad person? So Ezekiel goes on. If he has exacted usury or taken increase, shall he then live? He shall not live. If he has done any of these abominations, he shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. And then it goes on. Uh, Who have withdrawn his hand from the poor and not received inter usury or increase, but has executed my judgments and walked in my statutes, he shall not die for the iniquity of his father. He shall surely live. If you take... If, if you take bribes to shed blood, uh, you take usury and increase, you have made profit of your neighbors by extortion and have forgotten me, says the Lord God. Then uh, another uh, passage from Ezekiel, he eats, and this is the bad man, he eats at the mountain shrines, he defiles his neighbor's wife, he oppresses the poor and needy, he commits robbery. He does not return what he took in pledge. He looks at the idol. He looks to the idols. He does detestable things. He lends at interest and takes a profit. Will such a man live? He will not. Because he has done all these detestable things, he is to be put to death. His blood will be on his own head. So this is, this is how Christians understood usury historically until the last couple of centuries. I want to read something from Dante. So Dante, in his Inferno, where does he put the people of usury? So he's inheriting these Christian uh, ethics. And then he writes this epic poem. So he says, uh, From divine intellect and divine art, and if you pour over your physics closely, you'll find not many pages from the start that when possible, your art follows nature. As a pupil does his master, and art is all things that people create, his context. That when possible, your art follows nature, as a pupil follows his master, in effect. Your art is like the grandchild of our God. For art and nature, if you will, will recall the opening of Genesis, man is meant to earn his way and further humankind. But still the usurer takes another way. He scorns nature and her follower, art, because he puts his hope in something else. So then uh, there's some commentary on this. Dante puts the usurers in the lowest subcircle of the seventh circle of hell, with others whose sins are regarded as doing violence against nature and nature's God. 
Many people have noted that usurers are placed deeper into hell than violent murderers, violent suicides, blasphemers, and sodomites. Dante regards usurers as perverting art, i.e. productive skill, by means of which we are supposed to pr produce and create and thereby imitate the goodness of God. Usury is the anti-art. It produces nothing substantial, being just a set of multiplication games with money, and therefore does not really contribute anything to, quote, earning one's way and furthering humankind. It merely gives the illusion of doing so, and is therefore a sort of mockery of both human reason and divine providence, indeed a sort of universal violence against neighbor, God, and one's own reason, an extraordinarily efficient form of violence by which you do the most damage with the least effort. SubhanAllah. And so we have a whole system built on a practice that a conscience as Christian puts someone in hell lower than murderers and suicides. La ilaha illallah. Allahu Mustan. Uh, may Allah help us. Uh, yes. Isn't capitalism in general based on that concept of doing what you can? Because you look at, you know, the prices people charge. Like if, if we can, we can get high, away with it. They'll, they'll charge as much as they can get away with. So yeah. just the whole general system. Is I wouldn't like say it's just capitalism. It's definitely. Uh, capitalism opens the door to such exploitation. But look at communism. Like if, if, if the party can take all the wealth and give all the privileges to their kids, then they'll do it. You know, if they can uh, create an economic system that's just as materialistic, even more rapacious in terms of its de ecological destruction, look at the old Soviet Union. They destroyed the earth. They, they drained the waters out of the lakes. They poisoned the land. Look at communist China right now, even though it's a ca capitalist economy. Look at the ecological damage. They have to stop driving cars someday. There's so much air pollution. The fish are dead in all the rivers. There's so much toxic waste dumping with no regulations. It's human greed. It's, it's definitely manifests itself in, amongst capitalists but it also manifests itself amongst communists. You know, when, when Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge were murdering everyone in Cambodia in the name of communism, were they murdering their own children? You know, your children can die, but our children we're sending to Europe to go to school. So it's human greed, human hypocrisy. May Allah ta'ala spare us. Allah Ta'ala spares. Uh, one of the modern movements that tried to revive, revive real Christian teachings, some of you have heard of the, the uh, Catholic Worker Movement, founded by Dorothy Day, primarily uh, in the 30s or in the 40s. So they would set up, they have one in Berkeley, the Dorothy Day House, where they rent out or buy property in some of the most blighted neighborhoods and feed people and give medical services, and let people sleep there. But one of their foundational principles was the rejection of all interests. And so she wrote a letter when uh, one of the houses, one of the cities claimed, I forget, I think maybe in Detroit or New York, I think it was New York, for eminent domain, but they didn't pay them right away. So when they paid them like 18 months later, what they owed had accrued interest. So she wrote a letter and she said, we're returning the interest on the money we have received because we do not believe in money lending at interest. As Catholics, we are acquainted with the early teaching of the church. All the early councils forbade it, declaring it reprehensible to make money by lending it out at interest. Canon law of the Middle Ages forbade it and various decrees ordered that profit so ordained was to be restored. In the Christian uh, emphasis on the uh, in the Christian emphasis on the duty of charity, we are commanded to lend gratuitously, gr gratuitously, 
to give freely, even in the case of confiscation, as in our own case, not to resist but to accept cheerfully. So she, she, she gave the money back. She said, we don't deal with interest. Even though it was is based on you usurping our property. And if you want to take our property, property then we give it to you uh, in, a, in a spirit of graciousness. Because it's not about our property, it's about our principles. And well, these, these are, uh, I'm not saying uh, to that extent, but we have to stay focused is not about property, it's about principles. And, uh, and we, have to, we have to maintain our integrity as Muslims because if we're the last community that takes, as a community, that takes the prohibition of interest seriously. And if a lot of people here are renting because they don't even want to go with the Islamic finance models that are out there because there's shubha, there's doubtfulness in them. And so they're renting. Alhamdulillah. Haniyun lakum. So, but we have to hold on. If we let go, it's over. It's over. It's like we're on the barricades and we're holding it down. And if we, we give up our positions, the fortress is going to be overrun. So uh, there's a... Uh, well, we'll get to that, inshallah. <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran declares war on the person dealing in usury and interest. The only, there are only three things. One is rare, I forgot, but it's not in Imam uh, Dhahabi's Kitab al-Kaba'ir. It's in Ibn Hajar Haytami's collection. But two well-known uh, situations where Allah ta'ala declares war on the perpetrator. One is interest. And so Allah tells Ya you Haladinam and Takula whether Rumah Bakaya Minoriba in Kuntum Mini Felam Tafalu Fat the Nuru Biharbim Minolai Warasul and Tubtum Felakum Rus and Warikum La Tolamun or La Tolamun. So Allah says, O oh, you believers, be mindful of Allah and leave what remains of interest what, over and beyond your principle. If indeed you are believers, and if you fail to do so, then be warned of war from Allah and His Messenger. And if you repent, then you can have your principle. You will not, you will not oppress other, others, nor will you be oppressed. You will not oppress others, nor will you be oppressed. As we said, interest is the key to oppression. And it's the, from the deception of shaitan, so shaitan only promises deception. So shaitan says, he says, listen, human beings, come and let me tell you something. Come close. Because I want to whisper it. Because when I'm whispering, that's my west west. Like, west west, west west, west west. Onomatopoeia. So let me whisper it to you. So he says, you know, listen, I know all these religious books, they say don't deal with interest, but listen, if you have interest, you know, you can make exponentially more money. Then there's enough for everybody. And then, say, yeah, you know, if we have more, everyone gets more. And so what happens, we, we build this usurious system, and then we see the greatest disparities and income distribution in the history of humanity. The shaitan only promises deception. Whole countries are, are, are impoverished because they're, they're, they're cut out of, of the, the international fiscal pecking order. They're at the bottom of the totem pole, the last rung on the ladder. Like whole communities here are being systematically disenfranchised economically marginalized. And then you should see the things they're talking about what we should do with these people, these marginal people. 
So one thing you do with them, you, you try to get them all to hate Muslims and Islam, to divert their attention away from the real source of their problems. That's part of it. You know, that's part of the whole setup. Historically, you, you, you revive a simmering racial tensions at times when people are starting to build transnation, transracial solidarity. You know, all these tricks. But where's the promise of shaitan? Where's everyone benefiting? You have all this inequality. 1% of the people have more wealth, 1% at the top and more wealth than the bottom 50%. Allah al -Mustan. So Allah declares war. The Prophet Wasallam. And the other, the second one, is one who uh, offends and transgresses against one Allah has loved, the awliya of Allah, which could be any of us. This is the description. Verily, those beloved of Allah. They will have no fear nor will they grieve Because they're with Allah They don't care about what's happening in the world too much They do their best but it doesn't grieve them But it could be Who are they? Those who sincerely believe But can we attaqoon? And they're, they're mindful of Allah, His commandments and prohibitions. It could be any righteous servant. It could be your husband, your wife, your child, your parents. So when you're screaming at your, your wife or your husband, ah! you, you, you drive them to close to insanity. That could be an a wali, a waliya of Allah. And then Allah declares war on you. That's my theory what happened to the Soviet Union. I've said this many times. Say it again. They killed the wrong, they killed some old lady in Afghanistan when they bombed one of those villages. And she's making tahajjud for the last 60 years, reading a khatam of Quran every 10 days for the last 60 years. She was always uh, taking care of the orphans in the village feeding them and providing for them and then they bombed their house and then Allah declared war on them and that was the end of the Soviet Union and that's why our country has better be careful you know one day they're gonna bomb the wrong house it's not gonna be pleasant so the la I said that once and the FBI <laughs> came to visit me <laughs> we heard that you are threatening war on America. Because <laughs> one of these riot tell you, they saw it, like they saw it on YouTube. And so one of these right wing groups, they called the FBI and then they came. I said, no, I gave them, I said, I'll give you a copy of, I said, God's going to declare war on America. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. God, not me. Not the brothers and sisters here. God. So be careful. <laughs> That's a true story. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is one of the most hum humiliating uh, parables concerning the people of interest. وعن أنس رضي الله عنه أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال الربا سبعون حوبا أهوانها كوقع الرجل على أمه وفي رواية أهوانها كالذي ينكح أمه So he said صلى الله عليه وسلم that interest involves 70 degrees of sin the least of them, the least أهوانها the least of them is like a man having sexual relations with his mother. That's the lowest of the 70. That's the lowest of the 70. Allahumma musta'an. 
So the Prophet Sallallahu and Islam are laying the foundation for a new economic order. And, and it led to economic pros prosperity. And we've abandoned it as Muslims to our peril. We've abandoned it to our peril. And it's still relevant today. So there's a, uh, a, a scholar by the name of Alstar McIntosh. He wrote a book called The History of Usury Prohibition. And he's saying, he says in that book, uh, he says, in particular, it is the belief of the authors that individuals or organizations in the West with money to invest, especially those which like to consider themselves as being ethical, might have rather more to learn from Islam than is generally acknowledged. But first, society has to be reconsciousized to the relevance of the age-old usury debate in modern times. So he's saying we have this economic system has more to learn from Islam than we will acknowledge. But he says before any learning can take place, there has to be a, a reconstruction of consciousness of the gravity of the crime of usury. We have to be reconscienced-sized. I can't probably pronounce it to the relevance of the age-old usury debate in modern times. So for modern times, it's over. You usury, this is the way to go. It's not the way to go. All of, all of, the, all of the things we see destroying the earth are predicated. Without usury, you can't have modern war. And that if you look at the history of the Rothschilds, and how they loan money to the governments to finance their wars. And that's how they got their power. If, if, and without usury, they wouldn't have their money. Without the money, you couldn't finance these war machines. Without the money, you couldn't, you couldn't produce on the economies of scale that are sucking all these resources out of the earth, and on, on the one hand, and producing all this indisposable waste on the other hand. It's all facilitated by the economies of scale that are made possible by, by usury. We have to return to human scales and our activities. It's all rooted in usury. So this is what uh, uh, he's saying, uh, Macintosh. So we, as again, as Muslims, all of these things. We, we should be in the forefront of the movement to preserve our privacy. We should be in the forefront of the movement to preserve the sanctity of life. Because as uh, one of the sisters mentioned last week, we see in our Muslim country, murder is normalized. You even get fatwas for murder. You know, innocent people who are Muslim just bombed and blown up. And it's a disease. It's a disease. I'll tell you a story. I went during uh, the, the early 90s when the Afghan war was winding down. And at that point, the Russians were gone. So what was happening? Primarily Hikmet Yar's group. They were bombing Kabul with all these rockets. So I was one of their people, we were going around fundraising, going to different messages. And so we were talking about this. I said, you know, how, how could you kill innocent Muslims? Uh, it's grave. Man, man, we mentioned here many times from, uh, uh, when we did the Ten Commandments, لَقَتْلُ رَجِلٍ مُؤْمِنٍ أَعْظَمُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ Min zawalid dunya. To kill a believing person is graver with Allah than wiping out the whole world. Man a'ana la qatli mu'minin. Walaw bi shatri kalima. Yalqa Allah yawm al qiyamti maktubun bayna aynehi. Ayisun min rahmatillah. Whoever participates in killing a believer even by uttering half a word. Walaw bi shatri kalima. 
meets the law on the day of judgment written across their forehead, I've despaired of Allah's mercy. It's, these are grave things, but you know what he said? He said, uh, during the war, the people in Kabul, they had it good. You know, everyone else was being bombed by the Russians and they're just going about their business. Now it's their turn. This is a Muslim. Justifying murdering innocent, oh, what, about 60,000 people were killed during those bombardments. Just innocent civilians minding their business. They're just in the wrong side of town. This is the side we want to take over. So all this stuff left over, this bombing the city, bombing the city. And then you, you rationalize. The sister said normalizing mercy, uh, murder. It's not murder anymore. It's, it's justifiable killing. Oh, we, we should be in the forefront of condemning this madness. Because that's what it is, it's madness. And why? Because we can do it. We can do it. I was saying, no, it's not about what you can do, it's what you should do. Allahu uh, mustan So then he moves from there to uh, talking about uh, the blood-based retribution. in dima' al-jahiliyyati mawdu'a. So the... the uh, Blood feuds of the pre-Islamic period are suspended. They're ended. So we'll stop here next week, inshallah. So we'll stop here. Any questions, comments? Anna was signing. Marhaban. Yes. Allah has the, definitely has the ability to stop it, but Allah Ta'ala put us in this world to test us as, as to what we're going to do. And so it's up to us to stop it. And it's up to us not to engage in it. Because we are the ones who are here to be test, tested as to how we're going to act. And, and, and Allah says, he, الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا. The one who's created death and life to test you, which of you are best indeed. And so, it's it's definitely Allah could stop it, but the nature of the test is to see if we're going to stop it, and even more importantly, if we're going to engage in it. And so we have to make, we have to make, we have to convince ourselves. Our, our Prophet Sallallahu he said, Kun Abdullah al-Maqtul, wa la takun Abdullah al-Qatil. So be the servant of Allah who's killed. Don't be the servant of Allah who's, who's, who kills. So if you're facing a Muslim, let him kill you. At least you meet Allah with a clean slate. This, and this is called the, this is called the position of Uthman. If a man could have wiped out those rebels who descended on Medina, there, there were at least 10,000 people in Medina, and they were all with Uthman, including Imam Ali. Imam Ali was with Uthman. Like people rewrite history. Hassan and Hussein were guarding Uthman's door. Imam Ali was one of the last people to leave Uthman's house, and he told him to go away. He could have told them, wipe them out. But he didn't want to meet Allah with the blood of a Muslim on his hand. So he said, let them kill me. They have to answer to Allah for what they're doing. I'll meet Allah, my hands are clean. Uh, we're all going to die. So it's how are you going to die? How, and so we have to make a priority decisions like there's certain things I'm not going to do. Even if it means that I die. Like someone gives us a gun and then they put a gun to our head, give us a gun, and they say, kill this guy, I'm going to kill you. They say, okay, man, I had a few more things planned, but <laughs> go ahead and kill me. 
Because it's haram for you to kill him. So you can't say to save my life, I'm going to kill this person and take their life. You know, that's, and you find that example mentioned in, in our fic books. So there, there are a priori decisions that if I'm in that situation, I'm going to die. Because I'm not going to take an innocent life, even if it means I lose my life. So, so you lose your life that day, or if, if you shot the person, now you have to meet a law and answer for an innocent life that you took. And then you only live two more days. You got hit by a truck two days later. <laughs> Everyone's going to die. It's just, it's just choosing the terms of your death. And choosing what you're not going to do and be led to do. Wallahu mustan. Yes, sir. So there are um, two questions. So one of them is about um, a lot of people don't. Um, men, for instance, or even take mortgages, but they still put money in banks, and the bank uses part of that money um, for lending purposes. That's how <coughs> And the second question goes to Syria itself. We, we oftentimes like just back away when those charges are brought before. So I haven't found anything with these Sharitas other than Iran, within the penumbra. Well, include in terms of the bank, well, you try, there, the Prophet mm-hmm. said a time would come when the dust of usury would touch everything. So it's hard to escape totally. And, uh, you know, keeping your money at home under your pillow hasn't proven to be necessarily the best place for your money. But even very rich people place money in holding their accounts. They don't put it in bank. Yeah, well, you could look for alternatives, mm-hmm. inshallah, time and share them and encourage people. Yes? I have a question from the live stream. It says, if you rent, aren't you helping the landlord pay his mortgage and thus partaking in the usury involved in buying a house? This is what we're saying. Uh, your intention, إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ It's hard to escape totally, so you do the best you can do. Your contractual arrangement with the landlord, you have a contract with the landlord. That contract doesn't involve interest. The landlord has a contract with the bank. That contract involves interest. His contract is between him and Allah, and your contract is between you and Allah. So you, you could get real strict, and then you create so much hardship on people that they don't even try. And so we have to understand, these are the circum. We're living here. You go somewhere else, it's the same system. So where are you going to go? So you just do your best and you make your intention. You pay taxes. Someone, I was talking after Juma this past week. Someone said, you know, uh, I don't even know if I should live here because I'm paying taxes and the taxes are going for the war. I said, my taxes go to fix the roads. You make the niyyah when you pay your money, this is to fix the potholes. Because some, they spend a lot of money for public works, so you make your niyyah, so you do your best. You make your intention, you do your best. And, you know, you could say, you know, brother, sister, you're absolutely right, so, you know, I'm going into the tent business, and you could pitch a tent in the park. That might be fine if you're single, but most sisters aren't going to go for that. <laughs> so, so you do your best. You do your best. <laughs> Seriously. Single guys, man, we, it's amazing. <laughs> uh, Ian, you t- he could tell you. Uh, when he was single, he could sleep under a bridge. Not anymore. <laughs> no, I'm not. Oh, do you have any suggestions or maybe examples of Muslim communities that have been able to, you know, check out, even if they are in hyper-capitalist societies, of creating their own, you know, autonomous, um, you know, economic model where we don't have to participate in it? And also the tax question, do we have religious basis to not pay taxes because of the bloodshed that it creates? And if so, are there any examples of Muslims kind of trying to make alternative economic models? Well, I mean, you can look in different parts of the world where they have it a little, a little more flexibility. 
uh, and certain neighborhoods in certain countries. I don't know uh, the financials in terms of do they have a separate sort of money or kind of a let or alternative uh, local currency system, Allahu alam. But they definitely have terms of uh, shops, make their own clothing, have their own food uh, production, etc. Definitely there are places where people have that. Those are things I think that people have to start doing. And uh, it's possible, but again, you have to be practical at a certain point in terms of you know, how much independence do you really have? Even if you have uh, a, a, a local alternative currency and it has its own multiplier effect, but at the end of the day, what, what is it going to be based on? In other words, what is the value that that currency have, like a gold standard? Is it going to be based on a deposit of gold that we have somewhere? Is it going to be based on dollars that people contribute into the system? Then where is that coming from? So at the end of the day, people have to work for a more just system, period. And it's, it might seem a daunting task, but this, this wasn't always here, which means it doesn't always have to be here. And we should definitely uh, work and advocate and begin to theorize for a, a more just system. That we, and, and, and like uh, Macintosh says, before you can do anything, you have to have the consciousness that something needs to be done. And so the, even developing the system you're implying, one has to have the consciousness of the need for it, number one, and then what are its parameters, number two, in terms of wealth generation, in terms of uh, ultimate connections to the larger system, what are the nature of those connections, how do you make them in a way that the usur usurious nature of that system doesn't taint it. So there's a lot of theorizing that has to be done. And it's, it's a, and in the early stages of capital, right, Marx wrote his uh, magnus opus, opus, open uh, des capital, right, and tried to build a movement. And look at the difficulty he had. Even when uh, uh, communism gained state power, in several locations, in the former Soviet Union, in the Eastern Bloc countries, in China, Vietnam, etc. Still, look where it led. And now capitalism is far more advanced, far more globalized, far more uh, institutionalized, and the, the means of uh, ideologically perpetuating that system are far more sophisticated. And, and so it's a daunting challenge, but anything's possible with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it takes a lot of work. People have to be really serious. And you're talking alternative economic arrangements. I mean, look how hard it is to, to create a truly interest-free bank. Look how hard it is to get oil from Cesar Chavez or Iran or whoever is offering some oil and distribute it to poor people here. Look how hard it was to get fish from Peru and start selling to poor people. Like the nation was doing, the whiting h and fresh from the sea, imported from Peru just for you. <laughs> and you know, what happened to that program? You know, so there are definitely challenges, but with vision and courage and hard work and tawfiq from Allah, if Allah wants it, kun fayakun, be and it is, it will be. But it's a lot of work. Allah did say the interest will end, though, right? 
Huh? Allah said that infants will end, right? He said that this will end. Marido. Well, it did end then with the coming of his prophet, Sallallahu But it didn't permanently end. Yeah. Yes? GMOs? Yes. Uh, let there be no alteration in the natural way created by Allah. So that's definitely altering the natural order of things. Will Allah explicitly? No, that's implicit. Explicitly, that's, see, this is uh, where you need the flexibility of, of the, the legal thinking and that one of the great fund, fundamental foundational legal maxims in our religion la darar wa la dirar and the hadith of the prophet sallallahu there should be no harm nor reciprocating harm so from that we get one of our great legal maxims ad dararu yuzal harm is to be removed and so we see the harm that's caused by these genetically modified plants a lot we don't even know yet but now they're saying this is probably one of the primary reasons the bees are dying. Uh, it, it, it creates a situation where certain corporations are gaining control over the food supply of entire nations. Be, because they're, they're, they're putting in a lot of these, they're putting killer genes in the seeds where if they cross-pollinate with an organic plant, they'll kill the organic gene. You know, so there's, there's compound evil that's only multiplying. Uh, and a lot of them are, they can't grow naturally without, so all of these Monsanto seeds, the only thing that uh, you can use as a pesticide is Roundup one of the most vicious poisons in the history of humanity and that kills everything except that particular plant <coughs> and then but gradually uh, the weeds in the vicinity they, 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 they mutate they, their genes get crossed and you get these, these super weeds like they're finding in Canada in the canola fields that nothing can kill so, you know, you, it's a very slippery slope. And I would say that if you look at Darar Yuzal, harm is to be removed, then you could definitely argue that the harm is clear. And uh, we, need to, we need to remove it. Well, wallahu alam, but there's nothing implicitly. How could there be? These things were unknown when the Quran was revealed. So there's a temporal aspect of many of the legal injunctions in the Qur'an. They have a, a, a context for their revelation. So the, how could the Prophet say, Sallallahu don't use gen genetically modified <coughs> seeds when there were no genetically modified seeds? So we can only infer from the principles that are available to us. We're going to stop here. It's getting late. People have to go home and get ready for work tomorrow. Uh, if there are any other remaining questions, we can start next week with those, inshallah. May Allah give everyone long life, filled with good health, and much kadma, and much blessing. May Allah Ta'ala bless us to uh, try to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. May Allah bless us to uh, escape the dust of riba to the extent possible in our circumstances. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us to, uh, to respect the sanctity of life. May Allah ta'ala bless us to convey the trust that we have and to respect the sanctity and sacred nature of the trust. Walhamdulillah rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu yulayk wal asr inna al-insana lafi khusr إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته <تصفيق>